Have you ever wondered how chemicals in your brain affect everything from your mood to your sleep and how you act on a day-to-day basis? That's what we'll talk about today. Biology gives you a brain. Life turns it into a mind. Jeffrey Eugenides. Today we're going to talk about some common chemicals that affect how your mood, how your brain operates. This is a fast-moving area of science, and we're learning a lot in the most recent years. There's a lot we don't know, and there's a lot we get wrong. We'll talk a little bit about that. In a past podcast, we talked about the role that dopamine plays, right? That's the one that makes you want to push the button one more time in a gambling casino or buy one more book or play one more game. It is the drug of more inside of us. Today, we're going to cover a little bit more about dopamine. We're going to talk about serotonin and we're going to talk about cortisol. Because we talked about dopamine in the past, I wanted to talk a little bit about some issues you have if you don't have enough or you have too much dopamine. I got interested in this a few years ago. I did the 23andMe genetic test and you get a flat file and there was another service that you can upload it to and find out more information, more studies about different genetic traits that you have. You have to keep in mind they are studies. They're a limited number of people. This is a brand new type of science for us. So a lot of this is correlation, which means we notice those two things are associated with each other. It may not necessarily mean that when we do these studies that it's a direct actionable item, that dopamine causes this or a lack of dopamine causes this. In essence, we'll just look to see if there's a relationship between certain levels. But there are quite a few things we do know about it. And if it's to be believed I don't have the genetic code that creates dopamine in the same way most people do, which I've noticed in reading about it a little bit more. The chemical hormone of dopamine makes you want to get more and more and more. It makes you crave a response over and over again. When you lack dopamine, it's kind of a weird thing. I don't really get that excited about things. And it makes me think that my dad, who had addiction problems, maybe had the same type of thing. Because when you don't have enough dopamine, your brain keeps trying to strive to get it. And it thinks, if I just do this thing one more time, if I play this one additional game, I take that extra drink, or I smoke that extra cigarette, I'll feel that dopamine hit. And then when it doesn't happen, the brain becomes even more desperate to get it to happen. When I looked at my genetic uh, documentation that came with 23andMe, It said, in essence, that if I smoked, I drank, I took drugs, I would most likely do it to the point of addiction, which is good for me that I never really got into it. But then suddenly I'm interested. What does that mean when I have that particular brain chemical level? The other thing that's interesting about dopamine in general is you can get addiction problems if you don't have enough dopamine. Or you can get addiction problems if you have too much dopamine. It seems like dopamine really sets us up either way to get excessive amounts of whatever it is we're trying to get. So I realized about myself, I have to be very careful. I have a family of alcoholics. And so when you see something like this dopamine level, you realize this was treading on dangerous property when you do too much of something where you can have an addiction. Have I had addictions before? Absolutely. Video games, get obsessed about things. So one interesting thing about this when researching it is that cocaine works two different areas when it comes to our dopamine. It hinders dopamine being reabsorbed into the brain and at the same time increases the amount of dopamine in our system. So the brain crashes on the dopamine. It start starving itself out of it, which then causes that person to use more cocaine because of that crash of dopamine. So this isn't someone who has low levels of dopamine naturally. It's cocaine creating an artificial situation where they're lacking dopamine and it causes them to try to get more of dopamine by that, like I said, addictive behavior of doing something more and more. In gene research, when they're looking at dopamine and what causes a person to be 
disposed to possibly being addicted to things, they found that low levels of dopamine leaves them catastrophically unrewarded, it says, and unmotivated. So that means that you're having this, what they quote, reward deficiency syndrome, which means then you even try to get more dopamine by doing the addictive behavior, or you're so lacking in motivation, you just can't get yourself to do anything. So not having enough dopamine is really a way of getting addicted to things because of the chemical makeup of your brain. The next chemical we'll talk about that's in the brain is called serotonin, and it's a chemical. The nerve cells are what produces serotonin, and it sends signals in between the various nerves in your brain. And so it's found in the digestive system. It is also having to do with our, like what they talk about, our gut biology. It's in our blood and inside of our central nervous system. So serotonin is made up of amino acid called tryptophan. If you ever heard of that, they talk about it in those big turkey meals at Thanksgiving. Turkey has a lot of tryptophan, and when you eat it, it gives you that very serene, relaxed, sleepy kind of feeling to it. But that amino acid is responsible for serotonin in our bodies. It helps us to regulate our systems, It has been linked in the past to depression and anxiety. When you have low levels of serotonin, it used to be thought of as a sign of depression or possibility of anxiety and depression. A huge umbrella study just recently came out and found that people who had depression or people who didn't have depression had no difference in the amount of levels of serotonin in their bodies. So that brought into question a lot of studies and a lot of prescriptions given to depressed people to increase their serotonin. Does it mean that low levels of serotonin doesn't cause depression and anxiety? It's hard to say. Again, the study was just backtracking and looking at a lot of retrospective data trying to see if there's a correlation between the two. It didn't find any. So it may be more complicated than we understand. And it's important to realize, too, that people who have anxiety and depression may not have those same types of triggers. They all might come together with mood, with experiences, and then the chemical makeup of our brain. Maybe a lot more has to go into it before we figure out what causes it. My 23andMe said I also lack serotonin, which is interesting to me because I don't have depression. The other part of what serotonin does is at nighttime, it creates melatonin. And melatonin is a biological clock sleeping chemical. It's what makes you sleepy. It puts you in that right frame to fall asleep and keep you asleep. And so a long time ago, when I first got the DNA testing, I started taking melatonin, hoping that it would help me sleep. And you know what? It did. Because in my mind, I didn't have a sleeping problem as much as I had a shift of the circadian clock. Almost like I was built for Hawaii time, but living in the Midwest in the United States instead. So I was just shifted later. And melatonin helped bring that back so that I'm tired at the appropriate time so that I can go to work the next day. You know, if I didn't have to work and I didn't have to keep a schedule, I'd probably let it go and just do what it wanted to do. When I read that serotonin creates melatonin and that I lack serotonin, if I started taking serotonin supplements, would I then create melatonin? And you know what? I stopped with the melatonin for a while. And sure enough, if I took serotonin, it didn't really do much for my mood. I didn't really have a mood problem before, but it did help me fall asleep at night because suddenly I had enough to create melatonin. It helps us keep regular circadian clock rhythms. A lot of times people take melatonin if they're going to a different time zone. You know, maybe you're going to go to Europe from the United States and you're trying to shift your time and get on a sleep pattern that's good for Europe. It helps with sleep disorders, like I mentioned, not being able to fall asleep at the regular time. It can be used for insomnia, although if you read reviews, you'll see that a lot of people go, I don't get it. Melatonin really doesn't do anything for me, but for me, it puts me to sleep. And so, again, it makes me feel like that serotonin issue is right on target for me. But if you're not having that circadian clock issue, 
and your sleep issues are related to something else, melatonin probably won't even do much for you. And they talk about it as um, shift work. Uh, Sometimes when people work a graveyard shift or a swing shift at night, it has been seen to help people get into those sleeping times, again, at a different time than they're normally used to going to sleep. Serotonin is also responsible for eating and sleeping, digestions. It helps us heal wounds and is somehow related to healthy bone levels. So when you're talking about osteoporosis, somehow there is a correlation between people with low serotonin and bone density, which is really interesting. The serotonin in your bowels help you stay regular and function properly. There's also some relationship between serotonin and feeling nauseous, which they think has to do with if something upset us and we throw up, or if something is in food that we think is bad for us, maybe we'll get that gag reflex. Somehow the serotonin in our blood helps generate that feeling of nausea if it thinks we're in trouble. And it does some other things, again, like blood clotting and some other breakdowns of it. But it is something in our bodies that help all sorts of different parts of it. It's also found in most animals. The last drug we'll talk about is called cortisol. And this is another hormone inside our body. And a lot of times it's associated with a stress hormone. But it is responsible for controlling our stress, helping our body use the fats and proteins and carbohydrates inside our metabolism. It suppresses inflammation, which is bad for us, right? So if we hurt something and we get swelling, that's inflammation. But inflammation, even on a smaller side, is if we have heart damage or we have internal organ damage. Inflammation is generally just bad for us. It's a sign of aging. And as much as we can control inflammation, it's better for us. It's also used for regulating blood pressure, blood sugar, and it is the stimulant that wakes us up in the morning. So we're sleeping away. We're getting ready to get up. Cortisol starts working inside of our body and it starts dumping sugar into our system. Everybody's sugar, for the most part, tends to go up right about the time that they're going to wake up because the body says, oh, Jill's about to get up. Better give her a dose of sugar so she has some energy to get going with her day. That action helps us wake up and brings us back into a wake state again. So you can kind of look at melatonin and cortisol as being opposites of each other. The interesting thing is that there are people who are either diabetic or pre-diabetic who have something called the morning syndrome, which is too much sugar in the morning because cortisol is going nuts. Maybe they already had too much sugar in their body because they're getting a little close to diabetes and cortisol is just kicking that up a stage. And so people who have that syndrome are trying to reduce the amount of sugar they have in the morning and not add to it. It helps in that fight or flight reaction. So again, we're coming up, we're living in our huts and a tiger comes in and we need a quick burst of energy so that we can fight the tiger or run away That's what cortisol does. The body senses that stress and it immediately dumps out sugar into our system so we have that energy. Someone was bringing up an interesting point when it comes to our modern era because it used to be that when we had that high level of stress, it was because something physical was happening to us. So cortisol would dump sugar in our body and we'd fight the tiger, we'd run away, we would lift the machinery off our coworker in the factory, but we did something physical once we had that level of stress. But our modern world isn't like that anymore. Instead, we're sitting at our desk, we get a nasty email from a customer and suddenly our stress levels go up. Our body doesn't know that it's not a tiger, it just knows that you're stressed in a very dangerous situation, it feels. And so it dumps that sugar into your body and you're not burning it off by running away from the tiger. You're just sitting at your desk stressing. Maybe even worse, you go get a candy bar out of the vending machine because you're so stressed out. So cortisol is having an interesting relationship in our modern world. And then they believe that that's a little bit why our health is deteriorating in the modern sense. We're not getting that exercise after a cortisol hit. 
And our stress is much more dangerous to us now than it used to be in the past, unless the tiger got you. It says that cortisol also then boosts our immune system, again, because maybe we're fighting a tiger and we fight the tiger and we get scratched on the arm. Then our levels of immunity go up because maybe we're in a dangerous situation and we have to fight off stuff that we got inside of our skin during a horrible fight. Our immune system goes up. It works on the blood pressure. It can cause low level blood pressure if you have lower levels of cortisol or vice versa. You have high levels of cortisol, you might have high blood pressure. We talked about how it regulates the sugar in the body from the pancreas to release sugar into the system. And having high levels of cortisol can be a reason for getting type 2 diabetes because, again, that blood sugar is flowing. It's also responsible for our waking and our sleeping. When we are about to wake up, cortisol floods into our system. Maybe we had a nightmare and suddenly our blood is pumping, our heart is racing. Maybe some cortisol is putting some sugar in our bodies because it wants us to go. It can cause some problems if it goes off at the wrong time. So getting normal levels of cortisol, which means controlling the amount of stress you have on a day-to-day basis, is necessary to keep you out of the diabetes, to keep your system regulated, and finding other methods to control your stress so that your body doesn't hit that high stress level, dumping cortisol in your system will help you in the future. So the hypothalamus is involved in regulating this particular hormone in our pituitary glands as well, and it controls when and how much cortisol is released into our bodies. And so it's important when controlling those levels of cortisol that our hypothalamus, our pituitary gland, and our adrenal glands are all working appropriately. There are some different tests that doctors do in order to make sure that our cortisol levels are doing okay or at normal levels, and so they might test it out to see. So during our waking morning period, we may have 10 to 20 micrograms per deciliter of cortisol in our system. From 4 o'clock, we might have 3 to 10. Again, we're trying to be awake in the morning and we're trying to start going to sleep at night. So having that regular pattern will help us do it. There's an illness called Cushing's disease, which is when you have too much cortisol for a long period of time. and It can happen because maybe you're taking steroids. It can happen because you may have a tumor or you have some of these other areas, your adrenal gland, that are not working properly. And if you start getting Cushing syndrome, it may be weight gain. It may be muscle weakness, some other things. Again, blood sugar is a big part of this with type 2 diabetes. So testing to make sure your cortisol levels are normal is important. Then there's low levels of cortisol And that, again, may be because the adrenal gland is not working the way it's supposed to be working. They call this Addison's disease. And the adrenal glands somehow get damaged, maybe by an infection or something that's going wrong. And so if you have low levels, you might feel tired all the time. You might lose weight. You might have a bad appetite or even low blood pressure. We talked about the fact that having a healthy level of cortisol in your body is important. And the best ways that you can do it is to do all the things that everyone tells you to do. Get good sleep, exercise to burn off some of that stress, find ways to deal with stress like deep breathing, meditation, prayer, ways of reducing tension in your body. Then make sure that they said that you laugh, you enjoy yourselves, you have hobbies that burn off some of your stress. And that you have good relationships with other people. That's also a great way to reduce the stress in your life. I even noticed about myself because lately I've been very stressed out. And the way that I always reduce stress wasn't there for me. And so I've been feeling stress building up in me much more than it used to happen. I usually live a pretty stress-free existence. Or not so much that it's stress-free, but if I get a lot of stress, I have good ways of relaxing. But without that way of reducing stress, it became hard on me. I could feel it, you know, um, build up in me in a day-to-day basis and feel like I wasn't getting rid of it on a day-to-day basis. So it's good for me, too, to try to figure out some other ways to drop the amount of stress in my life. Or if I get stressed out, 
to reduce the stress. And so I'm looking for some replacements for that. And if you're worried about your day-to-day stress, it's certainly good to talk to your doctor about it, maybe get your cortisol levels measured, and to see if it's having any sort of an impact on your body. It's important, again, that we keep cortisol, serotonin, melatonin, and dopamine at regular places. And when you're looking at it, if you see that you're having some kinds of hormonal imbalances, talking to a doctor about what you can do, testing your levels is a great step forward. So my challenge to you is consider how some of these hormones may play a part in your day-to-day life. If you're having trouble sleeping or you're having high stress levels or you're just fatigued all the time, I want you to think about those particular hormones and decide if it's time that you talk to your doctor about it because there are treatments for low levels or high levels of all of these hormones. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. If you please remember to subscribe and tell a friend about this podcast, I appreciate it. And remember that you can help your health and your hormone levels by taking small steps. 